Thank you for joining us on Heritage Events Live. We're delighted to welcome you to the next Missile Defense Review, Policies to Make America Safer. Please welcome our host, Patty Jane Geller. We hope you enjoy the program. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our event on the next Missile Defense Review. I'm Patty Jane Geller, and I'm the Policy Analyst for Nuclear Deterrence and Missile Defense here at the Heritage Foundation. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, the Biden administration's ongoing missile defense review, including what we expect to see in it and what an ideal MDR should entail. Uh, I'm joined today by two missile defense pros, so I'd like to invite our panelists to join me on screen so that I can introduce them. First, we have Dr. Brad Roberts. Brad is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy, a role in which he served from 2009 to 2013. Currently, he directs the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Then we have Dr. Tom Carrico, a senior fellow at the International Security Program and director of the Missile Defense Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So we're going to start off today's event with some opening remarks from each of our panelists and hear their thoughts on the next MDR. Uh, then we'll move into a moderated discussion. We'll have time at the end for audience questions, so please submit your questions uh, using the control panel on your, your GoToWebinar screen throughout the event, and um, I'll get to as many as I can. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Brad to please start us off. Patty Jane, thanks so much to you and to the Heritage Foundation for convening this uh, important and timely discussion, and thank you for the opportunity to contribute. Uh, I should begin by noting that the views I express are my personal views, uh, drawing on my time in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, and should not be attributed to my employer or its sponsors. Uh, it was my pleasure and honor to serve uh, as uh, the co-director of the first ever uh, Ballistic Missile Defense Review back a dozen years ago, and, and then to be steward of one of the few areas of national policy to enjoy bipartisan support. Uh, I keenly hope that support continues, but in my view, it won't be possible without recognizing the approaching crossroads and then agreeing on a new course. What, what do I mean by this? We, well, we've been on a certain trajectory in the development of our national, of, of our overall missile defense strategy and posture. It's had three main elements. First, stay ahead of the rogue state threat. Secondly, assure Russia and China that we have the ambition only to seek, uh, the, the ambition to field defenses against limited strikes of the kinds of which uh, regional challengers, rogue states are capable. Uh, and, and thirdly, we have sought to develop and deploy all the regional missile defense as opposed to homeland defense that we and our allies can afford uh, and noting that this is uh, defense is aimed at protection against all threats whatever their source including of course russia and china that's the legacy trajectory that we've been on uh, and lots of people in the missile defense debate imagine steady as she goes down this uh, trajectory but I think there are some challenges coming, crossroads coming. First, what does it mean to stay ahead of rogue states when North Korea gains the ability to overwhelm the existing system? According to NORTHCOM in an unclassified discussion, uh, that might come as soon as 2025. Uh, and, and are we prepared to engage in a prolonged offense-defense competition with North Korea and potentially others as the number of their ICBMs grows and the, the quality of their penetration aids improves. Um, secondly, what does that imply for the reassurance if we go that route? What does that imply for the reassurance of Russia and China about our limited aims? Uh, in order to cover this gap, well, uh, in or if a gap emerges as NORTHCOM's prediction suggests in our in our protection posture uh, one way to cover it was proposed by the ballistic missile defense review of the trump administration which was to, to deploy an underlayer uh, and uh, this is uh, 
raised a question about just how many interceptors the United States might be capable of deploying in time of crisis for protection of the American homeland against all threats, not just the limited threats from rogue states. Uh, and, and of course, we've seen lastly, the emergence of significant Russian and Chinese regional missile threats uh, that, that call into question the viability of the current uh, incremental approach to developing the regional missile defense posture. So I'd like to invite the group to think about the question of uh, fit for purpose, what purpose are we headed towards? Uh, let's look ahead a decade. A, a policy review should look ahead through two terms and a little beyond, so out, out to 2030 and a little beyond. What does it mean for missile defense to be fit for purpose? What is the purpose? Well, one option is to, to stick with the, the legacy approach, that the fundamental purpose of missile defense of the American homeland is to negate rogue state threats. Uh, if we if 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 that's our purpose, then we have to accept that we're to we're going to have difficulty staying ahead, and to stay ahead, we're going to bump up against that commitment to limited. Second, an alternative purpose is to turn missile defense to the main new problem: major power rivalry, and to conceive of a missile defense strategy that supports the objectives of compete deter and win as set out in the last national defense strategy. And a third alternative or a third alternative is um, to establish that the purpose is to protect the United States and our allies from the main strategic problem we confront today, which is blackmail brinksmanship and coercion by nuclear armed adversaries, regional and major power who might employ missile attacks in limited campaigns in support of their blackmail brinkmanship and coercion strategies. These are three different purposes for which missile defense might be deemed necessary and pl plausibly fit in 2030, and I, and I hope we can have some discussion of those alternative objectives. Now, I don't know if it would be possible to agree on a new course, uh, or even to agree that we're yet at a crossroads where we have to come to terms with these issues. I think the odds of agreement would improve if the Missile Defense Review takes on two specific tasks. First is to frame clear arguments about the specific roles of missile defense in an integrated deterrent strategy. Anyone familiar with the missile defense debate understands the core argument here that missile defense is a complement but not a substitute for nuclear deterrence. And a little more fidelity on that main argument would I think be useful in establishing some broader agreement about what we, what we mean by fit for purpose in 2030. And the other task I think the review should uh, accomplish is to frame an answer to the persistent debate about whether the military and geopolitical benefits of missile defense have been outweighed by the geopolitical costs. This issue comes back time and again in recent years, and it would be useful to have a marker set down by the administration on that question. Patty Jane, you asked us to keep our remarks brief. I've tried to do so. I hope I've stirred the pot usefully. Back to you. Great. Um... Thanks, Brad. Those were um, great remarks to get us started off and thinking about um, some of the, the broader issues that hopefully we'll get to talking about during the rest of the event. Um, all right, Tom, now I'll, I'll kick it over to you for your opening comments. Well, thanks, Patty Jane. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you and Brad as well, as he said, for a, a timely discussion. Uh, I want to begin by uh, asserting, we'll talk a little bit about the situation we find ourselves in and then kind of five issue sets uh, that might serve as waypoints for the path forward. And I want to begin by asserting that, that active air and missile defense is a, is a critical subset of missile defeat and a non-nuclear enabler of integrated deterrence. Uh, but realizing those capabilities for whatever set of purposes, to use Brad's phrase, uh, in a way that's meaningful for strategic competition with your peers uh, is going to require breaking some China. Now, a little over a year ago, I suggested that the, the missile defense world is 
uh, kind of finds itself at something of, a, of an inflection point, uh, the most significant in the past 20 years, but it remains to be seen kind of where we're, we're going, inflecting up or down. There's some aspects of the 22 uh, budget request for missile defense and defeat that suggests strategic alignment uh, is being sought, even if it's not yet realized. Um, I think it's important to begin by, by noting that, you know, in today's environment, uh, the U.S. monopoly on precision guided munitions is no more, and our one-time assumption uh, that air superiority is a birthright uh, is likewise no longer uh, here. Uh, what we're seeing, uh, in the words of the uh, Marine Commandant, as he's put it, is the emergence of a new era of missile warfare. Uh, it's really manifested by a surge in the global supply and demand for a, a whole spectrum of air and missile-based attack capabilities for ourselves, for our adversaries and our partners, but also an increased surge in the global supply and demand of means to counter them. A special characteristic of this, uh, this particular time we find ourselves in, uh, is the specter of complex, structured, and integrated attack, uh, mixing and matching different parts of that spectrum across different types of airframes of altitude, speed, propulsion type, and range. And you're seeing a whole lot more emphasis put on distributed operations, mobility, and passive defense. And you're seeing a lot of internationalization, technical maturity, expanded missions, and even commercial, more commercial competitions for active defenses. Uh, but all of this has also raised the prospect for non-nuclear strategic attack, which in turn uh, raises and, and requires us to raise questions about escalation control, crisis stability, and deterrence. What we saw in Abkhaz and al-Assad in the past year or two years, our Russian and Chinese friends can do orders of magnitude more. Now here at home, as Brad was saying, the missile defense conversation has, has been shaped for many years by a kind of consensus around several, several tenets, including that active uh, air missile defense contributes to regional deterrence, that the United States relies upon nuclear deterrence for the near-peer ICBM strategic challenge, that the defense of the homeland against rogue state ICBMs is nevertheless necessary for deterrence failure, and that agile acquisition authorities remain necessary to pace the threat. I'll just begin by saying that the, the legacy of the Trump administration here is mixed. The last missile defense review did a lot of good things in terms of describing the threat spectrum, reaffirming the contribution of active defense to deterrence and stability, talking about international cooperation and improved offense-defense integration, and reaffirming the need for flexible and agile acquisition. But the 2019 Missile Defense Review got one thing especially right, as it said on its first page, that the degree and urgency of change required to restore conventional and missile defense overmatch should not be underestimated. Unfortunately, neither the Trump MDR nor its associated budgets and programs adequately made that adaptation. And I've suggested we're thus in inadequately aligned with their own national defense strategy and the central challenge of our time. Besides still being focused on the, too focused on the rogue state ballistic missile threat, the last MDR was overly MDA centric. It was insufficiently prescriptive and it showed insufficient attention to survivability and resilience in the face of that complex and integrated attack. Another less appreciated way in which the Trump administration, its legacy kind of haunts the missile defense world is with a March 2020 directive type memorandum impeding missile defense acquisition authorities. Never mind the recommendation of the last two reviews and numerous congressional pronunciations on the same matter. Now, in its interim national security guidance and elsewhere, the Biden administration signaled its intent to sustain its focus on China as the pacing threat. And to make such an adaptation, we might think about the MDR's potential in five issue areas. First of all, framing the issue in terms of missile defeat. This is the first pillar. Uh, first of all, not just in terms of active defense, but missile defeat, and looking at the full threat spectrum. Active op attack operations and passive defense are great, but you can't supplant active defense entirely. Scud hunting is hard and some things can't be moved or hidden. Uh, so this really is a, an enabler uh, of deterrence. But the new era of missile warfare is about more than one agency and much more than one threat. And this MDR could be less MDA centric and include more attention to service uh, air defense and DOD wide efforts from mud to space. And uh, don't take my word for it, but the image of the smoking hulks of air defense launchers in the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict of last year 
should remind us of the importance of this full spectrum uh, force protection issue. This is a policy issue. The MDR shouldn't wave away force protection uh, for active missile defense elements and leave it up to the warfighter because the warfighters can't defend against UASs or cruise missiles with capabilities they don't have. Now, the second major pillar here is what, with what might be called a, a regional warfighter-centric focus. And I think I'm going to try to answer Brad's question about what purpose uh, with a, a regional focus uh, for uh, the near peer, and especially China. And the need and opportunity here is to make the main thing the main thing. And I'd suggest that Integrated Air and Missile Defense for Indo-PACOM could be this administration's equivalent of the European phase adaptive approach with if the phased implementation of a defense of Guam uh, as its centerpiece. There's a lot of other opportunities, of course, to contribute to regional needs, such as the acceleration of various sensors uh, and effectors for hypersonic defense, perhaps leveraging some of the NGI or next generation interceptor uh, discrimination and sensor work for regional applications. And Brad mentioned the layered homeland ballistic missile defense. That too might be redirected. If one of those SM32As can hit a basic ICBM, it might also be good for a more stressing IRBM. And of course, North America is a region too. And it's high time to move out on selecting an executive agent for homeland cruise missile defense and improving information sharing at regional and command seams. The third pillar is one you heard about during the, the budget rollout, the move from legacy to next-gen offsets. I might suggest that that would be most manifest in a few areas, uh, with a multiplicity of elevated sensors, the continuation of the next-generation interceptor, and perhaps the restoration of some directed energy work. Uh, but when it comes to that, that long-term mission for homeland BMD, I think it's important that we not rush it and we retain focus on the uh, preservation of the mission, not, not, not just for this decade, but for the long term. And capability, competition, and conservative acquisition strategy may be even more important than schedule. The fourth pillar is about the missile defense enterprise. You know, you've got requirements and the warfighter involvement process, which probably could be strengthened, uh, but hopefully not bogged down, mended, not ended. On acquisition authorities, I mentioned uh, the directive type memorandum across the Pentagon, decisions for major ACAP programs are being pushed down to deliver capability at the speed of relevance. But in this field, again, the legacy of the last administration uh, seems to be in the opposite direction. And I would hope that this administration would not be bogged down uh, by the last on this particular issue. Exercise this ghost, cancel the Trump DTM. And on the produ production side and the perennial discussion of transition and transfer, which is to say the transfer of responsibility for procurement of certain elements to the services, I say enough already. The issue should be settled in light of today's needs, not notional intent from two decades ago when missile defense was a glimmer in the eye of Donald Rumsfeld. Define transition as it's already been defined in practice as occurring in operations and sustainment. Keep element procurement and R&D T&E together. And the final pillar uh, is international cooperation. The demand signal for, for active defense uh, means an opportunity to increase not just military sales, but a whole range of cooperative work with allies and partners. And building up partner capacity here for both defense and strike is gonna be critical to our rebalance to, to PACOM, uh, but also doing things like alleviating strain on the Patriot Force. Now, the recently announced JASM, SM6, and Tomahawk sales to Australia is a tremendous first step, and one that deserves to be, to be followed. We also need to make sure that there's nothing standing in the way of these kinds of uh, efforts. Uh, building the partner non-nuclear missile strike capability is going to be critical to adapting to this new era of missile warfare and help stain the temptation of nuclear proliferation. Unless one wishes to increase the role in the salience of nuclear weapons in our defense plans, one had better increase the role and salience of non-nuclear strike and missile defense. Each of these five pillars are important to support in the next MDR. Uh, and again, to uh, try to answer Brad's question, missile defense must be made fit for purpose. And the purpose I'd suggest is to make the main thing the main thing, adapting our efforts to strategic competition with the likes of China and others, uh, which is after all the central challenge of our time. Thanks very much, Patty Jane, appreciate the opportunity. Awesome, thanks so much, Tom. Uh, so you both gave us a lot to think about and a lot to talk about, and I have a lot of questions. Um, so. 
I'm going to start on uh, some questions about, about Homeland Missile Defense, because you, you both brought up some important issues. And um, I'll start with Tom. You, in your third pillar um, of the five that you outlined, you talked about moving uh, to next generation systems. So, um, so obviously that points to the next generation interceptor. Um, NGI seems to be moving forward with support from both Congress and this administration, um, but we know that the program still has a long way to go before its initial planned delivery in 2028. So if you could go more, more into your discussion on NGI, um, as we watch its development unfold, how should we be thinking about the different elements of the NGI program, uh, like acquisition strategy and cost? Uh, and in that same line of thinking, should we be prioritizing um, speedy development to get it in as soon as possible or taking time to get the capability just right? Mm. No, I think that's a, that's a great question. And we hear uh, the combatant commanders, especially NORTHCOM and other folks, uh, kind of pounding the table about trying to, to get capability uh, move to the left, move sooner. Uh, and I think that's that would be great. Uh, you know, the discussion about delivering it in 2028 is is good. Uh, but I also think like that it's it's really important to get this right. Uh, and that we, we shouldn't rush it. We should focus on a competitive and conservative acquisition strategy. Uh, we had a different approach, you know, uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, and this is our second bite at the apple. I don't think there's going to be a third bite at the apple. So let's get this right. And if we have to manage risk in different ways during the 2020s or late 2020s, uh, in a sense, the longstanding bipartisan consensus around the mission, I would suggest is more important to preserve the mission. Even if we have to manage that risk with service life extensions, uh, missile defeat and other things in the 2020s so that we don't have to manage it indefinitely and give up on the mission uh, for the more extended period. I see, I think that makes sense. Um, so the NGI, um, it, you've talked about how it's necessary to, to outpace the North Korean threat, which, which we know is advancing. And uh, so Brad, I'll, I'll turn to you. you. You rose an important question in your remarks that um, eventually if North Korea is able to overwhelm our missile defense systems, our, our policy to outpace the rogue state threat um, either might no longer be sustainable or will bring us some new challenges. Um, and you suggested two other policy options for the future, aside from continuing down this same course of outpacing the threat, um, that I'd I'd like to, to push you on a bit more and hear kind of your thoughts on your on your own suggestions. So your your first policy option was um, to go down the road of, of major power rivalry for missile defense. Can we start there? What what exactly would that mean? Does that mean um, defending against Russia and China, which is our policy um, to use nuclear deterrence for now? And what what are your what are your thoughts on on that idea? Well, I think the the question of how to turn missile defense to the the long term competition with Russia and China remains in in front of us. We we've been clear at the national policy level that we seek protection against their regional missile threats uh, as much as we can afford and and um, as much as our allies want to contribute to their own own defense. <clears throat> and and we have not found it necessary to think about their ICBM threat or SLBM threat to the to the American homeland, having written that off as an unlikely scenario and in, in any case deterrable by other means. Uh, the introduction of hypersonic strike capabilities into their long-range strike toolkits complicates this picture for me. Uh, if, if they deploy these capabilities as simple supplements to their existing strike capabilities, that's less troubling from my troubling, but less less troubling than their deployment of these capabilities for new new missions in new ways, essentially uh, aimed at um, countering uh, t t taking out of the table our command and control assets early in a conflict. Um, that that requires some thinking about a role for defense. It seems to me, uh, and, and of course we have some people in our debate who would like to see. Uh, us uh, have the ambition and, and achieve the ability to negate their their ability to fire missiles at us under any condition. Uh, that I think is a, a, a long-term uh, dream that's beyond our reach and not worth uh, uh, the candle at the moment. And the, the third option you proposed was adjusting our strategy to defend against um, or prevent blackmail or coercion strategies, which to me sounds like defending against any limited strike uh, to the homeland 
maybe not just from North Korea. What are what would some of the benefits be of uh, pursuing that purpose? So from my perspective, it's difficult to imagine a circumstance in which an adversary would choose to conduct a very large scale strike on the American homeland. Um, or, or, or even even in the theater, uh, because to assembly, essentially empty their arsenal uh, early in an unfolding military conflict with the United States leaves them naked to wh whatever might come next. Uh, so their their strategies must be about uh, the limited employment of the assets they have in campaigns of attack, aimed at uh, first of all separating our allies from us. Uh, eroding our ability to project power and eroding our will to continue the conflict. Uh, and for these purposes, uh, we, we don't need astrodome-like protection of the American homeland or of our uh, deployed assets. We need the ability to protect against lim limited strikes. Uh, I, I don't know what that means qu quantitatively or qualitatively. I was one of the architects of phased adaptive missile defense which was intended to be the approach in three regions, not just Europe, but also Northeast Asia and the Middle East. Uh, and, and I think uh, Tom's, Tom's argument is, is sound, that we should prioritize uh, the protection of uh, assets in the Indo-Pacific from China's blackmail brinkmanship and coercion strategy with missiles. Uh, and th this is likely to require light protection some places but heavy protection of Guam. Great, so I'll ask about Guam. Um, now that you bring that up, Tom, you mentioned Guam in your opening remarks too and how that's an important part of a regional uh, warfighter centric focus. Um, if I could ask you a couple of questions about Guam. First, uh, why does it make sense to defend Guam? Um, you know, what, what about that island in particular? Why is that important to us? Um, and then when we think about the debate over uh, the exact architecture of a Guam defense system, which I know has come up in congressional debates, uh, what are some of the factors that we need to consider? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, and I, I, before I get to, to, to the factors, I want to just kind of underscore what Brad just said there uh, in terms of thinking through the theory of how an adversary might hold us at risk, either in the region or with uh, things in the homeland. And I just want to connect the dots there between my emphasis, between what Brad was saying, which I find compelling, and my emphasis that North America is a region too. And that we got to worry about that full spectrum of attack, non-nuclear attack, but strategic attack on the homeland that doesn't involve, to use Brad's phrase, emptying their, their quiver, uh, I think. So, so in terms of Guam, why Guam? Well, it's because for various reasons we've made Guam kind of a centerpiece of our presence and our power projection in the region, you know, putting aside other things. And so long as our broad, as broad U.S. deterrence and defense uh, and extended deterrence goals persist and require U.S. presence and power projection, you know, there's going to be some things like, like an island that you can't move or hide. And those things are going to require thicker or robust defense. And so given the importance we attach to Guam for those broader goals, you're going to have to defend it. And that's why the, the Indo-PACOM commander has been pounding, commanders plural, have been pounding the table saying this is their number one priority because they're looking at the big picture and saying we can't do our job effectively without protecting these forces and having adequate force protection here. And so then and you've seen, of course, Congress make a lot of noise about this, saying, hey, where's the plan? Uh, we want to see the architecture study for the defense of Guam. Uh, and, you know, uh, that, that, uh, that study's been underway. I'll just say uh, some criteria to think about in terms of which effectors uh, might be useful for going forward uh, and all this sort of thing. We have to honor the threat. And things like uh, proven reliability and maturity, interoperability with other air defenses in the region, both our uh, air defenses afloat and in the combined force in the region, uh, multi-mission capability, and then the ability to, to work effectively with, with other ground-based fires, uh, including but not limited to multiple services, hypersonic strike stuff. Those are all important. 
Uh, but Guam's going to need a lot of uh, a lot of defense, and we look forward to to having that architecture uh, proceed. Yes, one thing you mentioned is uh, hypersonic hypersonic missile to threat against Guam and uh, throughout the region. I'm wondering what capabilities do we have now to defend against regional hypersonic missiles, if any, and how important is the glide phase interceptor to improving defense of hypersonics? And uh, how do you see the technology for glide phase intercept progressing? Yeah. Uh, I'll take that. That's okay. Um, I'll just say, uh, just just stating the facts that the uh, the glide phase interceptor. We're looking forward, of course, to hearing about uh, uh, that program moving forward uh, more. I was gratified that the PB22 uh, budget request did include some modest increases to that particular line. That's a good thing. I would also just note, as a matter of of uh, the facts, uh, that the uh, approach to glide phase uh, interceptor, the hypersonic defense is proceeding out of the, the maritime shop, which is to say the Aegis uh, air and missile defense shop. So you're right, uh, if you want to defend Guam against not merely ballistic and cruise things, but also hypersonic things, then that is one factor that might weigh in uh, on the architecture. Uh, but you know, bottom line, if we're going to have a regional focus, let's make sure we can defend uh, places like Guam and the fleet against this full spectrum of things, whether it be gliders, whether it be cruise missiles or old-fashioned uh, ballistic things. Great. Well, unless, Brad, you have anything to add on this topic, I'm going to shift gears a bit. Um, okay, I'm going to turn to the, the strategic stability debate with Russia and China. Um, we know our adversaries claim that um, they need to build up their offensive forces because of advancing U.S. missile defenses. And this leads many to believe that um, if we agreed to limit U.S. missile defense, um, that could be a solution to Russia's and China's nuclear force buildups. Um, I'm going to ask this to both of you. What are your thoughts on this debate? Well, I think the uh, the terms of this debate are are, are shifting. The, there there might have been a time when um, additional American restraint on missile defense. We, we exercise plenty, when additional restraint might have um, had a, from our perspective, helpful impact on their thinking about how much is enough. Not gonna have an impact on their modernization. They both are engaged in nuclear modernization for, for reasons that have little to nothing to do with our, our missile defense. But they're thinking about how much is enough in the way of standing nuclear forces uh, as they modernize, has definitely been influenced by their their assessment of what's required to survive a first strike from the United States and retaliate through a, a thin missile defense. Uh, and, and there there might have been a time when we could have eased some of those concerns, but there there are 15 to 20 years down a pathway based on their their assessment of our strategic intentions and our expected future capabilities. Uh, President Putin famously uh, likened, likened this to a, a, a bulldozer uh, or a, a steamroller. We were just gonna continue to work this problem until we get it right. It's, a, it's inevitable. Uh, I think that's, uh, I, I think assurances from the United States at this time to Beijing or Moscow simply fall on deaf ears. They're seen as not credible. Uh, and um, accordingly, I don't see any prospect of new forms of Chinese or Russian restraint if we were off, if we were to offer some restraint in, in this area. Yeah, uh, Tom, what do you think? I, I would say that's uh, that's where, very well said. Uh, I would begin by uh, invoking uh, Rose Gottmiller uh, from the Obama administration in 2014, who in answering, in the context of a NATO discussion, answering kind of the uh, accusation that the United States was doing too much missile defense and this was being destabilizing and all this, uh, she just says, look, the, the Russians have more than we do in terms of active missile defense interceptors. And in her characterization, uh, we're just not even close uh, to disrupting strategic stability. Putting aside the big numbers of you know, accountable strategic delivery system, even putting that aside, the fact is, I think Brad was alluding to, to their development of all manner of different trajectories and undersea stuff and, and all this other sort of stuff. 
you know, there was a reason why the Trump administration, they looked at this. They, they probably came in with a fairly ambitious and aggressive attitude on missile defense, but they nonetheless ended up where they did in terms of uh, deciding not to try to counter the big strategic threat. And that's why I think it makes a whole lot of sense to go after, quote unquote, more limited uh, numbers, but highly capable systems, whether they be Chinese, Russian, uh, or anybody else. Uh, and oh, by the way, in the meantime, I don't. I think we're also in agreement that we shouldn't be uh, adding any additional limitations uh, or self-restraint, self-constraint uh, to our capability development. You know, I, I, frankly, I prefer them to have a little bit of uh, cost imposition uh, and doubt uh, sowing uh, to our adversaries as well. So the Biden administration just had its second strategic stability dialogue with Russia, I think, last week. Um, should the United States be willing to put missile defense on the table for, for arms control negotiations with Russia? Well, I think I think my I just I just tried to answer that, and I think the answer is no. I, I, and the reason is very simple. I just don't think we'll get uh, anything good in return, and we'll end up paying for it uh, more over multiple times over later on. I would I would give a slightly different answer, which is uh, the weasel words. It depends, meaning if if there's if there's some form of restraint, we're we're prepared to exercise unilaterally, uh, and and we can get and we do exercise restraint towards both Russia and China in the development of our missile defense posture, and it, and if there's something we can um, get in exchange for restraint, we're we're inclined to exercise already. Then then I'd be interested in finding out what that might be. So putting missile defense on the table and saying, you know, no no more homeland missile defense if if we get a, a new start follow on, I, I think that's not in our national interest. But to, to rule out any form of mutual restraint on, on missile defense with Russia, I think is a little too early to tell. Makes sense to me. Um, okay, well, we actually have a lot of really good audience questions, so I'm going to start to turn to some of those. Um, the first question we have, so what relative priority would you give to homeland cruise missile defense against Russian and Chinese threats uh, versus ballistic missile defense against rogue states? Can we take that? Uh, so I think uh, we got to get started. Uh, and I I'm disappointed that the last missile defense review just kind of kicked the can with the further studies on this front. Now, uh, a lot of the studies out there, I'll just say, have been uh, characterized by uh, circle drawing problems. Well, they'll take the picture of, the, of CONUS and draw a bunch of circles, uh, and then the problem looks impossible because of the limited defended area of these things, and it becomes many, many billions of dollars to be able to defend. But the problem with that approach is it's approaching the, 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 wrong, pro the wrong problem, the wrong solution. Uh, and we have to be fairly limited in terms of what we actually choose to defend. We have to have be very selective. And so, yeah, I want a, a thick defense for Guam, but the reason I want it is because there's lots of force protection involved there. So I think there's a small number of assets that really, no kidding, need to be defended against cruise missiles and other non-ballistic aerial threats uh, that can and should be gotten after. It's not rocket science. We're good at cruise and air defense, uh, but we have to actually do it. In the very near term, there's something that can be done here, and that is uh, picking an executive agent for Homeland Cruise Missile Defense, so we can at least begin uh, doing so. Brad, do you want to add on to that? Or? Given the little bit of time we have left, I don't think I really have much significant to add to that point of discussion. Thanks. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, so the, we, our next question is on the underlayer, which I wanted to to get to as well. Um, we have one one guest asking, "What are your thoughts on an underlayer composed of SM3 and or THAAD interceptors? Uh, is this feasible, affordable, or a smart idea?" Um, I'll give that to either of you who wants to take it. I'm happy to start. Um, uh, we we don't know if it's feasible or or, or affordable. Um, it's likely to be very expensive. Uh, it 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 may pose a 
a uh, workable solution to the problem of missile threats to the American homeland in time of war, it would come at the expense of the the conventional level of war because all of the Aegis vessels would have been pulled out of the war fight and brought back to the American coastline. Uh, or, or we would have spent a lot of money deploying Aegis ashore all, all around the country. Uh, put, taking away from the investment in, in the regional capabilities. So I see a cost benefit analysis here that hasn't really been conducted yet. I, I'll just jump in briefly there, Paige, and I'm going to use Brad's phrase, it depends. It depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, if it's about defending the homeland against a big ballistic missile assault, uh, that's one thing. Uh, if you're talking about providing a hedge to kind of get to NGI or get to NG, uh, next generation interceptor, you know, that might be another thing. Uh, but I would suggest that in terms of the cost and expense, there's a certain amount of non-recurring engineering work that needs to be done on, on evolving things like that and the standard missile family. It can and should be done, uh, irrespective of whether you start doing that circle drawing for CONUS that again is gonna be useful for things like the, the regional defense. And so there again, I think the, 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 the redirection, uh, not to a bunch of fielding of these things in Kansas, but the redirection of that effort to regional efforts would be a, a good thing here. Mm -hmm. And one more question on that. If we were to start to deploy or even work on deploying an underlayer to the homeland, how do you think Russia and China would react and how, how do you think that could affect the strategic stability dynamic? Well, they'd react badly, of course, mm -hmm. um, because um, uh, what they have feared is that the further development of the American homeland defense posture will not be as it's been incremental and slow, but move forward in great leaps. Uh, and um, that making making it less predictable and more challenging for them militarily. Uh, and they, they would argue that if, if there was any doubt about America's commitment to strategic stability, this, this proves it's not. I, I, I think I would, I would just add to that though, it, it kind of uh, comes down to your theory of what they're trying to do to hold us at risk. And we can put a whole lot of ballistic missile, exoatmospheric ballistic missile, uh, interceptors of the homeland, but if they've got things to fly around them and hold us at risk, especially non-nuclear attack, I'm not sure it disrupts that uh, all that much. And so again, I recur back to to Rose Gothmuller's quote about we're just not getting close to that. And I mean, look at the numbers being procured here. The unfunded requirements list for for 2022 was like 12 Thad interceptors and one and a half SM32As. Uh, it's going to take a lot more than that to disrupt strategic stability than 12 or one and a half missiles. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so the next question is directed to uh, Tom. Uh, you mentioned in your, your opening remarks the, the Pentagon's update to MDA's acquisition authorities under the Trump administration. Uh, can you explain to us what the changes in acquisition authorities were and um, give us your thoughts? Were, was that a good thing or are there better ways to update the MDA's charter? Mm. So uh, I think the last time the MDA charter was updated but it dates back to, to your time, Brad, in 2009. Uh, and it, it does have some, some artifacts, references to things like ATNL uh, and the like. Um, but ju uh, just to, uh, uh, there's a saga that went on in the, in the Trump administration uh, that kind of in the breakup of ATNL uh, that it kind of uh, precipitated. Uh, and so just to, to simplify here, uh, began pulling pulling the acquisition authorities up rather than pushing them down, uh, uh, making MDA go get more permission before uh, making uh, major milestone decisions, and just getting a few more actors involved. And again, I think if on the, on the broad Pentagon-wide uh, push, that, that's going the opposite direction. And so I think, sure, update the, the, the charter, 513409, update it, uh, but do it in a way that's consistent with the broad push of acquisition reform uh, not inconsistent. I think that makes sense, Brad. Do you have any have any thoughts on uh, Tom's comments? Uh, just that this is one of the longest standing issues in executive legislative relations on missile defense 
uh, where there's been con constant friction about how to get the best results out, out of the development program. Uh, and, and my view is there's been a lot of tinkering with, with the approach, but no one's uh, been willing to push this all the way through to its, its logical conclusions. So we are running up on uh, time here. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Um, I'll ask um, one that was submitted by an audience member. Um, President Biden has stated that his goal of has stated his goal is to reduce the role of U.S. nuclear weapons in our strategy. Um, but a lot of options for achieving that goal, uh, like scrapping any of our nuclear modernization plans, are not feasible given given the worsening threat environment. Uh, so the question is, could missile defense be used to reduce the role of nuclear weapons instead? And if so, how can we do that? So missile defense has already played this role. It's, it's, it's contributed significantly to this objective. Uh, in, in the development in the 1990s, as we began to focus our strategic policy on rogue states armed with WMD and missiles, um, we saw reliance on nuclear weapons to deter threats from these states as not very wise, not very, not very reliable, because they might conceive of limited, they could conduct limited strikes without fear of retaliation, or that they could bear the burden of retaliation because frankly, they don't care about their people very much. Uh, and so missile defense immediately in the 1990s played an important role in reducing our reliance on nuclear weapons for, for that category of, of threats. Uh, it's also played an important role at the regional level of war, uh, reducing our reliance on nuclear threats to deal with nuclear and 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 non-nuclear but strategic attacks of of various kinds. Um, whether it can and so accordingly, uh, NATO and others have said that missile defense is a complement to nuclear deterrence, but not a substitute for it. Uh, I think our allies are very clear on this point, and I think for, for the most part, the U.S. strategic community is clear on that point. Uh, whether there's more that missile defense can contribute, I think, that would depend on a fundamental change to the technology of missile defense. Uh, what, what, if, if we really had directed energy options that, that allowed us to turn the offense-defense competition into, to the advantage of the defense, then, then maybe there would be some new new potential uh, ways in which missile defense could further reduce the role of nuclear weapons. But at this time, I don't see such a way. I, I think that's very well said, and I, I would say uh, there's two other things going on here. One, you know, if you want to reduce the role of no, nuclear weapons, but you also want to reduce the role of missile defense and conventional strikes, some, something's got to give. You can't just do less of everything and expect it to work out. And that's why I kind of caution that if you do kind of give up on some of the active defense things, then you better be prepared to increase the role of nuclear weapons. So this is connected to the discussion about no first use. Well, if you don't want to try to achieve and undertake that degree and urgency of change required to restore missile defense and conventional overmatch, to use the phrase from last review, if you're not gonna do that, then you might need to be prepared to uh, talk about first use uh, even more. And so that's a situation where I don't think we want to go in that direction. So I think we want to stay the course on the conventional and missile defense side instead, especially in the threat of non-nuclear strategic attack. I think that's a really good point, especially when you say that we can't just do less of everything and expect to maintain our, our deterrence against the threat. Um, so I guess I'll start to wrap up and conclude here i guess i'll ask one last question um what do you think we'll see in the biden in the biden's mdr i think it's supposed to be released at the end of the year or, or early january do you think we'll see brad uh, steady as she goes um do you think we'll see new concepts and ideas what are your um what are your thoughts or predictions my prediction is we won't see it at the end of the year um uh, my, my prediction is that um you know, the, the last administration struggled with multiple drafts of its missile defense review because to the when you when you walk in the room the first time, the, these issues look relatively simple compared to all of the other issues in the nuclear posture review and the defense strategy review and cyber and space, et cetera. And then you just start digging into the issues and they're not. They're not that simple. 
there are some big strategic questions here and the, the answers to those questions have to align with the answers reflected in the NPR, the, def the national defense strategy as a whole. Uh, the last administration struggled through multiple drafts to get to its an answer. Uh, I, I anticipate some struggle here as well. Yeah, I, I think that's a good prediction. Uh, I think we'll be lucky to see it by the budget submission uh, next year. Uh, and that's that's probably okay. The, I, I think uh, we can expect them to, as Brad said, ask the big questions uh, and perhaps work on on getting some uh, getting some answers. But a lot of that's going to depend on where they go on the NDS and what they mean by how they put together the different pieces uh, of integrated deterrence. So we'll look forward to seeing it. Great. Well, I think we're going to uh, end it there. Thank you both so much for joining us today and for uh, giving us your, your expert thoughts uh, and opinions on the next Missile Defense Review. And thanks for our audience for joining us. Um, I think you'll, as one housekeeping, I think you'll receive a short survey uh, at, at the end of the event that we'd ask you to fill out. Um, and we should also be posting a recording of the event on our website within the next couple of days. Um, so thanks, thanks again to everyone for joining us and hope you have a good rest of your day.